Hello and welcome to Ear Read This, the podcast that swivels books around in your ear holes to wax lyrical about literature. Haven't used that tagline in a while. Uh, meant to come up with a new one, um, but then I just uh, didn't. So <laughs> fascinating how the, uh, the human mind works. My name's Ash, and today I'll be talking about Love's Labour's Lost. Written in 1594-5, it is one of the last of Shakespeare's early comedies, and makes ideal material for a sunny winter's day such as this, um, full of sharp, breezy frivolity, and yet its final notes sound the end of youth. Our setting is the court of Navarre, where the king and three of his lads decide to swear off women and other distractions to pursue being full-on boffins. Just as luck would have it, four appealing ladies are trotting in from France. Don't you hate it when that happens? You're trying to go full time as a boffin, and some beautiful temptress slinks around the corner, and you think, ah, oh, not again. And then she turns out to be the heir to France, and that only makes it worse. And you have to put down all your complicated machinery and dust off your courting trousers and your cape. Story of my life. First things first, the title. Uh, it trips a lot of people up and has been recorded through the years rather inconsistently with apostrophes dropped and S's being added or taken away. But the modern generally accepted title is love apostrophe S, labour apostrophe S, lost, as in the labour of love is lost. Not the lost labours of love or my loves and labours both are lost or the Tory loves that labours lost but the labour the uh, campaign of wooing is lost. And as that title suggests, this is a comedy that won't end, as most do, in weddings. I said it's, uh, it's one of the last early comedies, and that is an entirely subjective and sweeping thing for me to say, really. But um, I just feel, I just feel, I just feel, as a mother of five, um, that this play, Love's Labour's Lost, rounds out a sequence in Shakespeare consisting um, of the three plays we've already covered in the podcast, uh, Two Gentlemen of Verona, Taming the Shrew, and Comedy of Errors. Uh, after this play, his comedies are quite different animals. They, um, they crawl out of the swamps, they uh, develop social skills and feathers, and soon enough they are hunting each other for sport. Uh, his next comedy is A Midsummer Night's Dream, uh, which is something of a departure, and I at least think of it as uh, somewhat separate from these four. Um, and that play, by the way, is probably going to be the last Shakespeare we will cover in 2018. So look for Midsummer Night's Dream coming in um, probably mid-December. I've got a chef's flair for what's in season. Um, so when I say early, I'm maybe using a misleading word. I'm less interested in the dates than Shakespeare's changing attitudes and habits, the comic conventions that he loses interest in, his developing grasp of theatrical technique, and his own power as a theatre maker, as a producer, which means he can drop a few theatre tropes he was never that interested in, like uh, jigs at the end of a play. It's difficult to take the dates seriously a lot of the time because we don't know um, we don't know that we're right about um, a lot of them, uh, but also, despite the fact that Shakespeare was very prolific, which encourages us to track phases in his um, in his writing life, he was very prolific in a very concentrated amount of time. So when I say that Love's Labour's Lost is the last early comedy and um, Midsummer Night's Dream signals something new, I'm talking about two plays that were quite possibly written in the same year. So what I'm calling a what I'm grandly calling a phase is perhaps ending in January and the next one kicks off in the spring. So it's all really more to do with how we make sense of um, the corpus, um, not a historical or biographical um, assertion. You know, we never think of long dead, or, or we rarely think of uh, long dead writers as being capable of the same kind of uh, pluralism that, that modern ones are. You know, uh, writers who despite going through a phase and, and departing from their early stuff, they sometimes revert to old habits uh, or, you know, like filmmakers or bands end up nostalgically going over the early stuff, um, you know, once the money runs out or whatever. So yeah, take the dates with a pinch of salt, a big one. I'm not, as some of you might notice, going through the plays chronologically anyway. Uh, after this one, A Midsummer Night's Dream, it's my plan to do uh, Romeo and Juliet at the start of 
next year and then to tackle the hollow crown in the first half of uh, 2019. The dates that I use in the episode title, if anyone um, is wondering why I bother doing that, if I'm saying that dates are uh, tricky, uh, I'm just using them as a as um, a formality, really. Uh, I'm taking them from the paperback uh, 2005-ish Penguin series of Shakespeare books. Uh, you've probably seen them. They've, they've got white covers and slightly etchy stained glass looking designs um so if you're confused because i say oh love's love's lost was written in 19 uh, 1594 to 5 and your copy says something completely different uh, that's fine I, i'm afraid that's just the way it is with reading shakespeare anyway enough um pre-waffle proffle um let's lose some loving labors I don't always do uh, plot outlines because I figure if even if you've never read certain Shakespeare plays, you absorb a sense of how things turn out. Uh, plus, you could get an outline just from Googling it as you listen. But I think it's worth frisking through the plot with Love's Labour's Lost because I'd like to refer to parts of the plot that, as I proceed without stopping to explain a scene in full. It's not one of the um, better known plays, be honest, you've never read it. Uh, and relatively infrequently performed. In fact, it was unperformed for 235 years between uh, 1604 and 1839. I'll talk a bit about the reasons for that later, but just to give you uh, two brief opinions from the Critics' Corner, William C. Carroll said, quote, The play has always been the darling of the Shakespearean lunatic fringe. And Charles Gilden said, it is one of the very worst of Shakespeare's plays. Now, I think I may say the very worst. Um, I love that. He couldn't, couldn't quite tell how, how crap he thought it was until he was halfway through the sentence um, that he was writing. <laughs> it's pretty crap stuff. No, actually, p powerfully crap stuff. Shall I cross that out? No, I'll just leave it. I'll just uh, underline crap. Many critics have speculated on uh, to what extent Love's Labour's Lost reflects contemporary events, John Carrigan being one of many to say hardly at all, though uh, he says, it seems to be an oblique response to the unification of France and Navarre under Henry in 1589-94. to He goes on to say that Love's Labour's Lost offered its Elizabethan audience a reassuringly light-hearted view of an alliance across the Channel, which was probably seemed in reality rather disturbing. The region of Navarre itself contained parts of northern Spain and southern France uh, until the Spanish contingent was annexed in 1516. French Navarre continued as an independent kingdom until being absorbed back into France uh, in 1589. So that's, that's just a very quick historical overview. I'm not going to refer to that too much, um, and you'll see why as we start to talk about the play. Um, I, I want to uh, slightly focus these episodes a bit more on on a, a couple of key points. I feel like in the last few I've um, uh, made about 20 points um, and skittered over all of them. So uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not going to go too much more into historical context. context. Um, but at least that'll explain why most of the characters are either going to sound French or Spanish. So without further ado, let's jump to the plot. The opening lines belong to the king. Let fame that all hunt after in their lives live registered upon our brazen tombs, and then grace us in the disgrace of death, when, spite of cormorant devouring time, the endeavour of this present breath may buy that honour which shall bait his scythe's keen edge and make us heirs of all eternity. So King Ferdinand announces to his three lords, Barone, Longueville, and Domain, that they shall swear off women and other indulgences, Barone agreeing with some hesitation. Shortly after, they receive word from Don Armado, a Spaniard visiting the court of Navarre, that he has caught a fool, Costard, consorting with a country wench, Jaquinetta. The king decrees in punishment that Costard must put himself at Don Armado's disposal and eat only bran and water for a week. Then the king and his lords get down to pursuing Boffindom. Next, we discover that Don Armado, this ridiculous, pompous figure, one that Barone quite hypocritically describes as a man of fire new words, fashion's own knight, himself has fallen in love with Jaquinetta the country wench. He confesses as much to his servant, Moth, and gets Costard to deliver her a letter. Moth, as he is called in my copy, in others he is Mo, as in uh, uh, Bon Mo. Um, his name is Word in this play, which has so much to say about words. Don Amado gets a marvellously exuberant scene-ender of a speech, saying, Adieu, valour, rust, rapier, be still, drum, for your manager is in love, yea, he loveth, 
assist me some extemporal god of rhyme, for I am sure I shall turn sonnet. Devise wit, write pen, for I am for whole volumes in folio. Um, ap apologies to any uh, anyone of of any race. Um, yeah, covered my bases there, I think. Uh, though we can tell that Don Armado is the most ludicrous character we've so far met, already we see that he's not too far removed from the would-be boffins, who even while they somberly close the study door in pursuit of self-betterment, they do so with great romantic flair. Meanwhile, the Princess of France and her three ladies have arrived in Navarre. She is told she cannot enter the court itself due to their recent oath, but instead the king will receive them outside in the grounds. A great deal of the play takes place outside, and we'll come back to why that's could be important later on. Would you believe it? The four men, the four men who have so recently sworn off love, fall in love with the four ladies without um, telling one another that they have trespassed from their oath. Costard now receives another letter, this time from Perone, intended for Rosaline, one of the uh, Queen's ladies, um, declaring himself. By mistake, Costard confuses the two letters in his possession um, and gives Barone's letter to Jacquinetta, the country wench, who isn't a character of great importance, and yet I seem to have said Jacquinetta, the country wench, about a hundred times. Have you met Jacquinetta? Jacquinetta, uh, uh, Jacquinetta. No, no, Jacquinetta, the country wench. Um, surprised, she brings this letter to Super Boffin Holofernes and his friend Sir Nathaniel. They tell her it was meant for someone else and that she should bring it to the king's attention. A set piece follows that we shall talk about in depth. Barone secretly watches the king, proclaiming himself, uh, sorry, proclaiming to himself his, his love for the Princess of France. Then enters Longueville, the king hides, and both he and Barone watch their friend uh, confess his love. Then enters the fourth, Domain, and you can fill in the rest. Longueville surprises Domain, the king surprises them both and chastises them for um, uh, breaking their oath, didn't mean that to rhyme. And then Barone um, reveals himself and drops the king in it too. Shortly afterwards, Jack Gwinnetta, the country wench, enters, reveals Barone's letter she accidentally received, and all four men stand exposed. Uh, but, yeah, not like that. They decide they will court their women after all. Have at you, then, affection's men-at-arms, says Barone, to fast, to study, and to see no woman. Flat treason gains the kingly state of youth. High fives all round. They decide to visit the ladies dressed up as Muscovites um, to hide their identities. The princess and her ladies get wind of this, wear masks and swap favours, little easily identifiable um, love tokens. And so the Muscovite lads all end up making advances on the wrong masked woman. Leaving and returning as themselves, the men are ridiculed by the ladies. Armado, meanwhile, gathers together Superboffin, Holoferns, Costard and Moth to present the Nine Worthies as an entertainment for the court. Now, the Nine Worthies were a group of heroes whose guises uh, page pageant or mask makers adopted to deliver short scenes on speeches. They tended to um, have three Christian warriors, which were King Arthur, Charlemagne, and either Guy of Warwick or Godfrey of Boulogne, uh, three Old Testament heroes, Joshua, David, and Judas Maccabeus, and three virtuous pagans, Hector of Troy, Alexander the Great, and Julius Caesar. In Love's Labour's Lost, Alexander is joined by Pompey the Great and Hercules. For a while, all is merry as the lads take the mick out of the performance, rather like the heroes of A Midsummer Night's Dream, laughing at Bottom and Company performing um, Pyramus and Thisbe. Uh, the mood is darkened by the entrance of Mark Hayes, a messenger who says that the uh, princess's father has died. This doesn't quite throw the king off, who says, um, Yet, since love's argument was first on foot, let not the cloud of sorrow jostle it from what it purposed. Um, the ladies tell the lords that if their wooings were not in jest, they should carry out a list of tasks for a year, and then presumably matured, return to offer marriage again. The lords accept, and the play ends with Don Armado presenting a dialogue between the owl and the cuckoo, representing winter and spring. And so it ends with the ladies uh, leaving back for France, and um, the men having sworn a new oath uh, on their own. Now, along with The Tempest and A Midsummer Night's Dream, Love's Labour's Lost has no direct source. It may well be uh, Shakespeare's first original story, not cribbed from Hollinshed's chronicles, like uh, his history plays are, um, or an earlier play from England or Italy or the classical world, like um, some of the comedies are that we've, we've talked about before. 
It could be a riff on a genuine meeting between Catherine of France and the King of Navarre, but uh, Shakespeare's knowledge of that meeting would have been so limited that if so, it would be a play based on hearsay and uh, rumours in the pub. Um, interestingly, in this rare original play, the standout scene with the four men recounting their loves is not original. As Jonathan Bate points out, it is almost certainly lifted from John Lyley's Galathea, 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 Rock me, Galathea, um, where a series of characters trespass the love they have forsworn in a similar sequence. As Bate puts it, quote, the weakness of the invented plot of Love's Labour's Lost suggests that the invention of plot was not our dramatist's greatest strength. This is an idea that has been glimpsed in earlier uh, podcasts, that Shakespeare confounds modern creative writing course dogma that plot and theme and style are separate ingredients that writers need to work on in the way that an athlete needs good stamina, good reflexes, and good shoes. Um, the majority of Shakespeare plays with celebrated plots, uh, including um, the Comedy of Errors, are plots that Shakespeare has pinched. The reason he has been forgiven, besides the fact that he didn't share our views on intellectual property, is that he tends to improve on the plot he has stolen. He is consistently the successful cuckoo, and while despised by uh, sparrows worldwide, in sheer Darwinian terms, can't um, help but impress. In Romeo and Juliet, for example, he takes the stuff of lengthy novels and narrative poems and strips them down to an urgent, seemingly unstoppable uh, tragedy. He cherry-picks Hollinshed's lengthy chronicles until he has a dramatic arc for each of his kings. Uh, many consistencies and historical truths are tossed away in his pursuit of chiselling source material into something um, theatrical. Sometimes, instead of chiselling, he complicates. In the Comedy of Errors, we saw that he, he doubles the number of twins from the, in the uh, Menachme to create even more confusion to unravel. And in Love's Labour's Lost, we see this process in miniature. John Lyley's uh, Galathea, Galathea um, features a scene where two characters separately soliloquise um, over uh, how they love one another. Um, the uh, dramatic effect, I suppose, or, or the interest for the audience is that each might be discovered. Shakespeare complicates the trick by having four, and instead of the dramatic um, pull for us, the audience, being uh, the confession of love being discovered by the loved, the reason we are interested is, uh, in whether or not they'll be discovered is that they are each breaking their oath. Something the three uh, sourceless plays of Shakespeare have in common is a focus on theatrical practice and dramatic art itself. Here in Love's Labour's Lost, much like uh, Midsummer Night's Dreams, Pyramus and Thisbe, or Prospero's uh, Vanishing Banquet in The Tempest, we have a late play within a play. As John Carrigan says, At the threshold of creative maturity, and again at the end of his career, Shakespeare seems to have needed to construct plays which, through their investigation of language, disguise, illusion, convention, directed action, and, dra and the drama which can be built from them, helped him come to terms with his art. It's tempting, at least for me, to go along with this to the point, uh, to the extent of imagining Shakespeare is so completely consumed with his craft that playmaking is the only subject uh, on which he can create original storylines around. And perhaps it's true in as far as he, he didn't have much of a meta-theatrical tradition to follow, or in a sense, it was easier to see himself as his own source material when it came to... Um, writing plays that commented on plays. But this is dubious territory to be wandering into, and as we'll see, there might be a much simpler reason why Love's Labour's Lost seems much more interested in word play and playmaking than uh, drama and romance. It is always the case with Shakespeare that we have to constantly reassess what grounds we approach, approach the plays on. Lumping Love's Labour's Lost into comedies intended for a mass audience like Midsummer Night's Dream is a mistake. The two plays, both described as comedies to us, seem completely unlike each other. I'm going to read a letter now, written in 1604 by Sir Walter Cope to the court of James I. The Queen referred to in the letter is Anne of Denmark, James's wife. Sir, I have sent and been all this morning hunting for players, jugglers and such kind of creatures, but find them hard to find. Wherefore, leaving notes for them to seek me, Burbage is come and says there is no new play that the Queen hath not seen but they have revived an old one called Love's Labour Lost, which for wit and mirth, he says, will please her exceedingly. And this is appointed to be played tomorrow night at my Lord of Southampton's, unless you send a writ to remove the corpus cum casa to your house in Strand. Burbage is my messenger, ready attending your pleasure. Yours most humbly, Walter Cope. Apologies for reading that badly. I wish I could blame it on Walter Cope's handwriting, but it was my own. I don't 
um, <laughs> possess the original. What the letter makes clear, though, is firstly that Love's Labour's Lost was, in fact, popular, even if it sounds somewhat forgotten. But secondly, that there was a type of play that were revered for their wit and mirth, uh, not as we tend to think now for their message, their moral or their drama. This is no surprise to the literature buff, but Shakespeare's work had to be performed in front of a paying audience. However, not all his plays were for the general public, and Love's Labour's Lost is one of them. These other plays were court plays, never intended to be performed for the great unwashed. As Anthony Burgess puts it, These little dramas were not for the public playhouses. Their delicate petals would wilt under the garlic blasts of the groundlings. They were performed before the Queen and in private houses. Now with this in mind, that it was a court play and never intended to be performed for the groundlings, we can rationalise a few um, oddities about Love's Labour's Lost. Firstly, the setting. The bulk of Love's Labour's Lost, as I said, takes place in the grounds of the court, most likely because that's exactly where it was being performed. The court of the King of Navarre was very likely first performed in the court of Queen Elizabeth. Uh, John Dover Wilson says that it was certainly played before Queen Elizabeth before um, Christmas 1597. I think perhaps it's Queen Elizabeth herself who might be responsible for the ending of the play, the non-traditional ending, the, um, the lack of weddings. Shakespeare is famously said to have included witches in Macbeth in order to interest James I, a, a big witch enthusiast who um, claimed to have met three witches, I think on the road to Oxford or, or something. Um, so Shakespeare has a track record for flattering his sovereign. Had uh, Love's Labour's Lost been performed as a uh, as a mass audience play for the groundlings, there's no question that the comedy would have ended uh, in marriages all round. But for the Virgin Queen, then in her later years, a uh, depiction of the Queen of France marrying happily at the end, and the indication that this was the done thing, might have been tactically unsound if uh, Shakespeare was interested in um, having, a, having a healthy neck. Instead, we have the decision, crucially spearheaded by the Queen of the play herself, uh, to delay marriage in order to focus on matters of state. And to this, it is all too easy to imagine Queen Elizabeth um, raising her glass, cracking a smile, hooting for more. Um, <laughs> uh, approving, is what I meant to say. Perhaps this also explains the subsequent drop-off in performances. Uh, it was performed for James I, an intellectual king, lucky enough in his lifetime to see the publication of Shakespeare's first folio and the King James Bi Bible. We can well imagine him, him enjoying the play simply on the merits of it being a Shakespeare. But after that comes the nearly 250 year break. This makes a lot more sense though when you consider how specifically it was uh, perhaps written for Queen Elizabeth. Why would a subsequent happily married or courting monarch want to watch this weird old comedy with a melancholy ending? By the time Love's Labour's Lost resurfaces, the concept of court plays has disappeared. Shakespeare is being mythologised as an immortal, and this strange comedy is then evaluated on the same terms as the other comedies. People speculate what preoccupation Shakespeare had to make him decide to make this frosty finale, marked it up to his infinite variety or some autobiographical reason for him to darken. The truth was probably much simpler. It actually does have a happy ending, a happy ending for its first intended audience, Queen Elizabeth. That being said, Love's Labour's Lost does seem to hold the promise of a sequel. Towards the end, Barone comments to the king, Our wooing doth not end like an old play. Jack hath not Jill. These ladies' courtesy might well have made our sport a comedy. The king replies, Come, sir, it wants twelve months and a day, and then twill end. Barone says, That's too long for a play. This might have been thought of as just a little in-joke, um, if it were not for the knowledge of a lost Shakespeare play with the title of Love's Labour's Won. Whether or not it was a direct or thematic sequel um, has uh, interested scholars for a long time, but it seems likely, or at least probable, that it was written after Elizabeth had died. Even by Shakespeare standards, Love's Labour's Lost is a wordy play. In modern copies, there's enough Italic Latin to drive even the casual reader to violence. Um, not only does Love's Labour's Lost have the longest scene in Shakespeare, it also has the longest word. Uh, Elizabeth Elizabethan equivalent of anti-disestablishmentarianism, it is, hold on to your hats, honorificabilitudinitatibus. <laughs> honorificabilitudinitatibus. Honorificabilitudinitatibus. Hattibus. I, I, I think I'm 80%. Um, it also has uh, characters inventing flourishes of puns, such as this, from Holofernes. 
The prayful princess pierced and pricked a pretty pleasing pricket. Some say a saw, but not a saw, till now made saw with shooting. The dogs did yell, put L to saw, then Sorel jumps from thicket. Or pricket saw, or else Sorel, the people fall a hooting. If saw be saw, then L to saw, make fifty saws a Sorel. Of one saw I am hundred make, by adding but one more L. And if that has you uh, grinding your teeth, then you are not alone. It is surely moments like this that provoked E.K. Chambers to groan, Little in Shakespeare is more tedious than certain parts of love's labours lost. One reason for the boom in uh, wordplay may well be Shakespeare realising that since this court play wasn't going to have a traditionally comic ending, he better fill it with something else. But there was also the fact that English was in the ascendance, rapidly absorbing aspects of other languages, and rather like Shakespeare himself, playfully helping itself and altering where it pleased. The upside was that English... The upside? Sorry, I went around to another... There. Uh, the upside was that English was being uh, dragged out of the Middle Ages and on its way to becoming universal. The verbal experimentation was democratising and exciting. While only educated gentlemen could expect to converse in Latin, as the Queen could, even the lower classes were able to take part in this marvellous bloom of language. The downside was that exuberants like uh, holofernes were appearing, world-class bores who quibbled in classical tongues. This fad of self-conscious linguistics was known as euphuism, uh, which, as Felicia Hardison Londre says, um, was an effort to explore and expand the possibilities of English language through rhyming, antithesis, alliteration, taffeta phrases, and lexical borrowings from classical Greek, Latin, and contemporary foreign sources. Longeville, one of the king's lads, responds to the proposed oath at the beginning by saying, the mind shall banquet, though the body pine. Fat paunches have lean pates, and dainty bits make rich the ribs, but bankrupt quite the wits. This rather uh, pompous self-sacrifice was exactly what uh, Shakespeare was aiming to lampoon. But as Victor Kiernan points out, Shakespeare was making fun of all this preciosity, but also revelling in the great feast of languages that was going on. He was busy piling up his prodigious vocabulary and never ceased to be a venturesome experimenter. We can see him, under the name of Holofernes, imping the wings of his own exuberant genius, as at present far richer than his knowledge of the world. And here, uh, Kiernan quotes Holofernes himself, remarking um, on his linguistic ability. This is a gift I have, simple, simple. A foolish, extravagant spirit, full of forms, figures, shapes, objects, ideas, apprehensions, motions, revolutions. These are begot in the ventricle of memory, nourished in the womb of Pia Marta, and delivered upon the mellowing of occasion. But the gift is good in those whom it is acute, and I am thankful for it. If one aspect of Shakespeare distinguishes him from the merely excellent contemporaries, it's his ability to in the same breath ridicule himself and rejoice in what he is ridiculing. Shakespeare, the voracious reader, has Barone say that too much reading dulls a person's life. As painfully to pore upon a book to seek the light of truth, while truth the while doth falsely blind the eyesight of his look. Light seeking light doth light of light beguile, so ere you find where light and darkness lies, your light grows dark by losing of your eyes. As John Ger Kerrigan points out, Barone here draws on the common 16th century belief that the eye produces the beams by which it sees. Whether or not Shakespeare was genuinely worried for his own eyesight, he certainly intended this to be a joke partially at his own expense. And it wasn't merely the multilingual variety Shakespeare rejoiced in, but also the metre of his poetry. As E.M.W. Tilyard said, The commonest metres, other than blank verse in the earliest comedies, were the decasyllabic couplet, quatrains alternatively rhymed, and rhymed doggerel. Love's Labour's Lost differs from the others in containing the smallest proportion of blank verse and the greatest variety of other metres. Now, I could bang on about the differences in the styles of verse, and have been tempted to do in uh, previous episodes, but instead, I'd quite like to do a separate verse and meter episode. I think it would be quite helpful for um, talking about uh, more Shakespeare as we go on. If people would find that useful, then um, you can uh, email at earreadthis at gmail.com, or just shout uh, shout really, really loud. Um, but uh, whichever you do, it, it has to be in verse. Now, I would say that to enjoy reading Love's Labour's Lost, uh, if I'm truly to say, here, um, read this, you must have some interest in the wordiness of it. The kind of person who wants to know that a flap dragon is a flaming raisin that floated on a mug of ale. Um, to enjoy the imagery of cormorant devouring time and get a kick out of the recipient of a flamboyant letter asking, what plume of feathers uh, is he that wrote it? 
If enjoying gulping down these little uh, flap dragons isn't enough for you, or if the um, feathers of the play plume too much, then you will probably find Love's Labour's Lost quite frustrating. Critics have often been put off by just how much Shakespeare enjoys himself. As William Hazlitt said, Shakespeare has set himself to imitate the tone of polite conversation when prevailing among the fair, the witty, the learned, and he has imitated it but too faithfully. And J. A. Herond, no, not Herond, <laughs> and J. A. Herond said, Her and J. A. Herond, I don't know, says, Love's Labour's Lost had no incident, no situation, no interest of any kind. The whole play is literally and exclusively a play on words. Um, that, I think, is over-egging it a bit. And here is where I, I turn my chair around, um, sit down with my uh, legs apart and say, let's talk masculinity. As I've said, Shakespeare enjoys linguistic excesses even as he mocks them, and a similar double-edged dynamic can be seen in his portrayal of the male characters. Peter B. Erickson has said that, for all its comic charm, Love's Labour's Lost presents an extraordinary exhibition of masculine insecurity and helplessness. They all have a slightly backward misogyny. Oh, sorry, I can't continue in that voice. I'm sorry my voices are so limited. I just thought it would be um, better to do voices than constantly say quote. And I know I've done a bit of both this time, but um, yeah, anyway. Um, I'm talking as myself now. Uh, <laughs> they all have a slightly backward misogyny. Their idolising and worship of women is so extreme that women in their eyes cease to become people, merely unknowable objects of um, beauty. Like Pygmalion in reverse, the male characters' uh, lovelorn soliloquies turn female characters we have just seen in the flesh uh, back into statues. The women are, in the words of David Bevington, the attractive yet baffling prize that seemingly cannot be attained or controlled. The baffling bit is exactly right. If we stop to wonder why Barone or the Prince don't just uh, go and talk to their respective suitees, the play fails. But this frustrating bafflement is also the soil of um, Shakespeare's poetry. He conjures out of the, their flawed bravado um, such musical bits as, uh, as this from Barone, which wouldn't be possible if he had more self-awareness. Is not love a Hercules, still climbing trees in the Hesperides? Subtle as a sphinx, as sweet and musical as bright Apollo's lute, strung with his hair, when love speaks, the voice of all the gods make heaven drowsy with the harmony. Here we have both of uh, Shakespeare's self-deprecations working at once. The misjudged bravado and lack of self-knowledge is what gives Barone's words confidence, and the bombastic lexical thrill is completely over the top, but memorably so. As um, G.L. Barber says, the strength of Shakespeare's comic form is precisely that the attitude Barone expresses can be presented as at once delightfully vital and foolish. The play is almost over before a male character is even considered being upfront or straight with the object of his affections, with the exception of Don Armado, who declares himself, um, ludicrous as he is, to Jacquinetta the country wench. The princess and Rosaline easily come off as the most intelligent and perceptive characters, who, without ever becoming cruel, easily outfox the efforts of their fumbling suitors. Felicia, um, Felicia Hardison Laundry remarks, Lacking self-knowledge, the men are afflicted with sexual anxiety, while the women, whose feelings for the men remain undeclared, enjoy control over the resolution of the action. I'm not suggesting that uh, there is a single simple reason why the women in this play have the control, behave cleverly and beyond reproach, and keep their romantic intentions close to their heart, but it is worth remembering again that this play's first audience was to be Queen Elizabeth. While the women uh, get the short shrift in terms of memorable lines and scenes, they are the real prime movers. As Peter B. Erickson says, and I've forgotten what voice I used for him first, so um, let's just spin the wheel, shall we? <laughs> the women's action is legitimate because it involves turning back on the men their own pathetic subservience. The men are given what they deserve. However, the women's capacity to pair taunt-like or uh, sway his state also confirms men in the worst fears about women which the convention has led the men to expect. In a self-fulfilling prophecy, the men's experience with the women proves what the clichés of their poetry taught about women's omnipotence and inaccessibility. Here Shakespeare's managed to have it both ways. Without compromising his female characters, he is allowed to present them as uh, the manifestation of the men's worst fears. It's very crafty how he lets the, uh, the men's vision of women play out and come, come to life, even if the performance of it has been affected by the women from the start. Untroubled. 
John Arthus calls the men in the safety of their little academe. Untroubled in their very peacefulness, they reject the possibility of unknown powers in nature and in their own natures to call any other tune than they themselves make up. What the men take to be their great revelation is the reversal of their oath. Instead of chasing books, they will use their skills to woo, as Barone encourages. The fools you were, these women to forswear, or keeping what is sworn, you will prove fools for wisdom's sake, a word that all men love, or love's sake, a word that loves all men, or for men's sake, the authors of these women, or women's sake, by whom we men are men. But as we soon see, this is no turnaround, no progress at all. More than he knows, Barone and his friends are the authors of these women. They have fictionalised them to death, robbed them of agency, and desired them, desired them only from afar. They do not know these women at all. From this moment on, Shakespeare exposes what Charles Knight called the false refinement of the king and his court buddies, as, in Knight's words, the more natural characters, one by one, trip up the heels of the more affected. Even Holofernes, the quibbling superboffin, somehow emerges as more authentic than the court men. Perhaps he really is a bore, a plume of feathers, a snob, but he isn't affecting it. He is given a moment of surprisingly tender pathos when he remonstrates with the mocking audience of the Nine Worthies. This is not generous, not gentle, not humble. Don Armado, for all his pomp, also seems more at ease with himself, having no angles or duplicity. He ends up with his beloved Jacquinetta, the country wench. Costard is the most successful of the Nine Worthies, and the women, despite the fact that they have bluffed and rebuffed the men, easily escape any charge of inauthenticity. As Bobby Ann Rosen, also known as Anne Barton, says, The contrived and fashionable poses the women adopt are in a sense less serious, more playful than those of the other characters, and they are conscious all the time, as even Barone is not, that these attitudes are merely poses, and that reality is something quite different. The st it's the startling end to the play that delivers that reality to the men. Intruding into the unravelling performance of the Nine Worthies enters a character called Marcade. He tells the princess that her father has died, and um, once he has killed the mood, he never speaks again. This, in a rather light and carefree play, is a brutal appearance of death. In two other earlier instances does death loom, um, when the princess kills a deer, or a pricket as it's called, uh, that's the one that Holofernes spins his pun verse out of, and a very short, um, sad remark from Catherine, one of the princess's ladies, who says uh, love killed her sister. He made her melancholy, sad and heavy, and so he died. Had she been light, like you, of such a merry, nimble, stirring spirit, she might have been a grandam ere she died, and so may you, for a light heart lives long. So it seems that having a light heart will keep the king and the men, uh, his men alive or even immortal. Without murmur do they pledge to spend years of their youth in study, uh, and the walls of Navarre, their little wonder of the world, feel like a walled garden, a serene and deathless place. But death still arrives with Marcade. I want to briefly talk about three brilliant ways Shakespeare ushers death into his um, uh, comedy. One theatrical, one literary, and one um, of contemporary interest. Firstly, the theatrical. Instead of uh, horns announcing a messenger or someone saying, oh, hello, here's Marcade, why the long face? Marcade enters in the midst of uh, Don Armado clowning around in the production of The Nine Worthies, and within six short lines has com communicated his message. This is not a lingering, uh, blood-curdling intimation of death, but a, a sharp chill interrupting, as the princess says, a moment of merriment. Secondly, a bit of masterful um, character naming. After all, Marcade might as well simply be called Messenger, but instead we have Marcade. Uh, I'm going to read you this from John Kerrigan's commentary in my copy of Love's Labour's Lost. Marcade's name is intensely suggestive. He comes to Mar Arcady, reminding those who shelter in Navarre's park, as though he were death rather than a messenger of death, that et in Arcadia ego is more than a conceit of pastoral. Uh, et in Arcadia uh, et in Arcadia ego, meaning I, death, too, lived in Arcadia. And because of this connection with death, Marcade's name also recalls that of Mercury, the god responsible for conducting souls to the underworld. Now, if you think that's a bit tenuous, just wait. The last speech of the play and the name Marcade also have a resonance with a morality play of 1590 called The Cobbler's Prophecy, in which, as Kerrigan says, the central character Ra Ra uh, Rafe, the cobbler, keeps calling the god Mercury, Marcady. 
And if you still think Marcadie and Marcade are uh, still a little too different, the character of Marcade has travelled from the French court, and his original surname would come with an accent on final E. Just like uh, today, I've been struggling with the one at the end of Felicia Hardison, Laundre's name. I, I keep worrying that I'm calling her Laundry. Um, but the accent on the E of Marcade's name would make his name sound more like Marcadie. One final way Shakespeare will have given his Elizabethan audience a jolt of something sinister comes before the entrance of Marcade, when Barone is proclaiming that the sickness of his old rage, meaning his ignorance, will leave him by degrees. He says of his other friends, Right, Lord have mercy on us, on those three. This might seem uh, simply a throwaway comment, a little of his old flamboyance perhaps, uh, until you discover that Lord have mercy on us was the inscription written on doors of houses infected with the plague. Whilst the nobility had far greater odds of survival than the lower classes, uh, this is still a strikingly grim image for Shakespeare to have um, introduced into his comedy. For all that nastiness, the fates of our characters remain safe, if chastened at the end of the play. After the king's clumsy effort to get back to the wooing, which I quoted in the synopsis, Barone says, Honest plain words best pierce the ear of grief, and yet still fails to recognise that the ladies are not going to remain. Each of the ladies following the princess, now queen's example, uh, challenged their wooers to spend a year experiencing the outside world. As John Kerrigan says, Recognising that the men have no faults which experience cannot amend, the princess, Rosaline, Catherine and Maria simply ask their lovers to submit to the trying complexity of life outside Navarre's park and to the power of time. Still, the lady's true feelings remain obscure, though EMW Tilliard takes pains to remind us that Navarre and his companions were handsome and attractive young men, and that women do not necessarily withhold their hearts from those they ridicule. So, in a reflection of their oaths at the start of the play, the men swear new oaths um, and to do as their ladies suggest. All in all, it is a touching end to this play, which, while containing buffoons and braggarts, has no one villainous or even particularly unkind. The men's proposed campaign of love has failed completely, but they end for the first time on terms of something like friendship. While the Queen Elizabeth explanation for this ending may be a factor, I believe, um, despite what I said earlier about how dubious this sort of guesswork is, that Shakespeare himself was indeed coming to the end of a, a kind of phase, whatever the chronology of the plays actually is. If this play was written around 1594 to 5, Shakespeare would be about 30 years old, hitting his stride as a playwright and feeling the tug of more demanding material than his um, earlier comedies. However, he was still young and perhaps his ambitions hadn't quite totally eliminated his youthful thrill for playing with words, uh, for characters of great bombast and for silliness. What made him great was that instead of dismissing the latter out of puritanism as others might, trying to force themselves to grow up, he allowed both sides of himself to flash on the stage, explored their limitations, uh, put them into uh, battle with one another, and ended on a note of uncertain commitment. Perhaps, says Charles Gildon, and I should, I should end on a voice, shouldn't I? Perhaps, says Charles Gildon, we are not to look for his beginnings like those of other authors among their least perfect writings. Art has so little, and nature so large a share in what he did, that for what I know, the performances of his youth, as they were the most vigorous and had the most fire of imagination in them, were the best. Thank you for listening to Ear Read This. Um, if you'd like to see more of what we do, you can find us on um, Facebook, uh, on Twitter, under Ear Read This, or you can drop us an email at earreadthis at uh, gmail.com. Thanks for listening, and happy reading.